beginning in talking about some of the keywords that are relied upon to make a determination that, in fact, the earth is described as flat in scripture. And some of those words include the firmament, the foundation, pillars, and the circle of the earth. And so I want to talk about those just a little bit in closing. Uh, because I do believe that although there is language that could construe a flat earth in the English, I believe that when you look closely at the concepts in Hebrew, you'll discover that something else is being revealed here. And in fact, it does reveal an, er an orbit of the earth. And so to give you an example, when we talk about the circle in the Isaiah passage, I believe it's 4022. And some people say, well, you can't, if it was a ball, why doesn't he use the word door like he did earlier in the passage? instead of using the word circle as he does there later on in Isaiah. And the answer is because of this word hug, hug, which is talking about the circle of the earth, but the circle of the earth can mean the orbit of the earth. He sits upon the circle of the earth, the circling of the earth, if you will, the circle of the earth, the orbit of the earth. Rather, it's describing the circling of the earth. Even the word door has its own issues. It could mean ball, very true, it could mean we have it as ball in the sephir. But it could also mean to be tossed round about. I will toss you, not like a ball, but toss you round about, which is another way that the word door is used in scripture. When you talk about the pillars of the earth, to the temple, or the pillars that are going into some other construction, there is a completely different word that is used than talking about the pillars of the earth and that the pillars of the earth are foundational or conceptual in idea. So for instance, if we were to say the pillars of the earth were the foundation is expressed in Genesis 1, the six days, those being the six pillars of founding. We talk about the foundation of the earth, the foundation being the six foundings. That is to say, he created light, he created the earth, he created the suns and the moons for days, times, or days, feasts, uh, excuse me, for signs, feasts, days, and years. And again, we have this idea of the sun and the moon and the stars being created for days and years. And the year, it strikes me, is not a momentous event with the sun and the moon orbiting over a flat earth in a discrete orbit. What do we really care? Except I think we see a lot more distinction when we're talking about the earth rotating around the sun. So the long and the short of it is, is that when you look at these words that are in scripture, and this is without going in and harboring it on the word tebel, which the strong says means globe, but it's never used as the word globe in scripture. Never, the word globe does not appear. I'm not gonna harbor in on that, but tebel bal tamot, lest the earth be moved out of its course, I will harbor on. So you see that there is a discussion about an orbit. There is a discussion about the orbit of the earth. There is a discussion about the earth being spherical. There is a discussion about the earth hanging from nothing in the book of Job. It says that the earth hangs on nothing. And when we talk about dividing the waters from the waters and the firmament, the firmament is not the dome over the earth, but the firmament is that which divides the eternal waters above from the eternal waters below that is called Shamaim, heaven. And as Zen and I have discussed, we've talked about this on his show a bit too. You know, in Enoch, you have this discussion of the seven heavens. And unfortunately for a lot of people who do not read some of the extra scriptural stuff, they don't get a chance to deal with the seven heavens, even though the second Hanok talks about even 10 heavens. And these things, I think, are really important to demonstrate the sevenfold mystery of his whole creation. That it's important to understand this. You know, Isaiah talks about ascending through those heavens in the ascension of Isaiah. Paul says that there were three heavens and he knew a guy who went to the third heaven. But guess what? When you look at the seven feast days, the seven feast days, right? You know these. 
at the Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, Yom Teruah, or Feast of Trumpets, Atonement, and Tabernacles, the seven feasts. But yet in Scripture it says that the males are required to come up to Jerusalem three times a year, right? One for the spring feast, one for Shavuot, and one for the fall feast. So it's described as three times you are to come up, like the three heavens. But actually, for coming up for those three times exposes you to seven feasts. Just as it would expose you, the three heavens would expose you to seven heavens. So, the long and the short of it is, is I do think that scripture does say that we have an earth orbiting. And it does say that we have an earth orbiting hanging on nothing. And that the foundations of the earth are the founding of the earth that Yah did in the seven days of creation. And I think when we look at that and we understand that, is it possible to justify scripture with the modern scientific understanding? And I'd say to you that yes, it is. It doesn't mean that the science community doesn't get things wrong. And it doesn't mean that the scientific community has been lying to us. And in the last 40 years, they've been lying to us nonstop. But in understanding that the world is round, that it's a sphere, that it orbits, that it's on an axial like this, that the poles move back and forth towards the sun, that the moon orbits around the earth, and that this is our condition, is not contradicted by scripture, even in its current form. Okay. Garcia, 10-minute closing remarks. All right. Um, one of the things that brought me to really doubt as far as the heliocentric model was the affirmation that not only is the Earth moving around the sun, but also the sun is moving around the center of the Milky Way and then the Milky Way uh, as a galaxy is moving around some grand universal center. And all of these motions, um, when you look at the stars uh, over the course of thousands of years as we see betrayed in the um, time-lapse photography of the star trails, it shows the circuits of all of these stars and all of the constellations moving in a circle around Polaris as the one fixed star of the evening. It has been like this for thousands of years. If we are, if the earth is moving and the sun is moving and all of these other motions are occurring at the same time, there's no way that the stars could remain constant and that we could see them in the same manner for thousands of years, and that Polaris uh, remaining in this same kind of visual system and observance, uh, that the navigators could for thousands of years have used it to determine where North is. And so, in, in my opinion, that, you know, again, nullifies the whole uh, basis that we're moving and the sun's moving and the Milky Way galaxy is also moving in this uh, grand circuit um, because the, the parallax of what we see every evening, all of that would change even daily. And then consider also that if the sun is at the center of the planetary, uh, at the solar system and the earth is moving in orbit around it, in six months when you're on the other side of the supposed um, you know, the orbit, wouldn't night and day, the 12 hours that make up and comprise the determination of day and night, shouldn't that be shifted? Shouldn't the 12 hours of day now be the 12 hours of night? And yet you have um, the, when they adjust the time, um, it's only by one hour. You know, every season they adjust for daylight savings time. They adjust it by one hour, but it doesn't make sense because 
again, if you're moving in circuit around the sun and in six months you're on the other side, the other side of the earth would be receiving all of the daylight. And so day and night should be flip-flop. But again, that is not what we see. Now, with regard to why the deception, the larger questions of why it, all of this, why would NASA be lying? Why would uh, Satan create this counterfeit system? Why change the, the holy days? Why change the calendar? Why change the cosmology? In my opinion, it all ties back to Lucifer's de declaration in Isaiah 14 to want to establish his throne above the stars and the clouds of God. Uh, uh, in the sides of the north, above the mount of the congregation, in being like the Most High. That he has created this counterfeit system in order to lead the world astray, as it says in Revelation 12, the ancient serpent, that old dragon, that deceiveth the whole world. That all of this is part of that deception. We see that according to the heliocentric model, the earth has been demoted as the center of the universe, as the narrow focus, as the beloved bride, we being the pro uh, prodigal child of the Most High God, that he is not contending with having to watch all of these other worlds and universes and planetary systems, but he is narrowly focused on us and what is going on here. And so these scientists have separated us from that deeper intimate relationship with the Most High God and have him somewhere out there in this ever expanding multiverse, this universe, when in truth, when you understand the, the system, the enclosed world cosmology, he is seated right above Polaris. He's right above the center of the Baltic Dome, and he is looking down upon us and watching everything and guiding everything to his own certain prophetic end. And when you understand that, our understanding of the creation and the creator shifts so dramatically that those that are brought to flat earth and the understanding of it, it renews their sense of who they are, where they are, and what all of this is about. And that, in my opinion, is so very important because the Darwinian, Copernican, heliocentric model, it's being taught in schools and universities all over the, over the world. This scientific religion, which is what it is, the astrophysicists, they are the neoteric priests of Baal. And they tell us that we are insignificant, the earth is insignificant, that none of this matters. And all of this is a setup for, in my opinion, the next phase, the next aspect of the grand deception. And that is that the ancient aliens are our creators. And you see this reflected in the ancient alien series, in all the belief in the Sumerian mythologies, which the Sumerian mythologies also, 6,000 years ago, they have encoded into them this heliocentric model that we are living in a planetary system and that the sun is the preeminent uh, body in the center of this planetary system. And in my opinion, coming to understanding as to the true nature of our cosmology, it shows you that the deception was started even that far back. And there's a reason, and in my opinion, that reason is to divide us from our creator and to set up the premise that the extraterrestrials are our creators and that they are coming to save us from ourselves. And so understanding that all of that is bunk you know, it totally, the flat earth destroys all that premise and it's going to keep those of us that know better and different from bowing the knee to the Antichrist, this impersonator, this false messiah. 
And knowing the truth is going to save our, our, you know, our salvation, our eternity. And what is more important to that than that? And so all these people that say this is insignificant, that it's just dividing the body, they don't know what they're talking about because this has led more children and more people astray and more people from knowledge and truth and understanding that the gospel is the inerrant word of God and that Christ truly is Savior Messiah. And so our eternities are dependent on this knowledge. And, you know, there's no greater issue uh, of importance, in my opinion, than what we're talking about this evening. Amen. Thank you very much. That is con that concluded the third phase of the debate, and now we are to Q and A session, where you can ask questions. Either candidate, I would like for you to come up here so I can hand you the microphone. You can line up. Just if you don't mind, please, just would you ask the question? Uh, you can state your name or. Where are you from? And then ask the question either Zen or Hi, my name is Mindy. I flew in 2010 to China and we went over the North Pole and from what I understand, that's done all the time, but I was told that flying around to the other side of the Earth, um, under the Earth, or uh, over the South Pole, is never done or forbidden. And uh, even if you're in Australia or somewhere far down south, you, you can't do that. Um, so that's my question. Is it true that, you're not, that no one's allowed to fly over the South Pole? And could you address that? Yeah. The answer is, no, that's not true. And there are several several reasons to go to that, but historically, there was an airline called uh, Aerolinas Argentina that used to fly nonstops to Sydney uh, out of Argentina, and they flew over the South Pole in a 747-200. But in the flight world, uh, you know, and I live like three miles from Bowen, and in the flight world, you have a thing called ETOPS or ETAPS, which uh, is, you can only fly a certain distance, uh, you have to have a runway. And so in a twin engine plane, you have to be within 450 miles of a runway. In a four engine plane, you have to be within 750 miles of a runway. And there are no runways that a, a plane can land on in Antarctica. That didn't stop Aerolinas Argentina from flying over it. And Qantas, in fact, has done several demonstration flights over Antarctica. And they have, there's videos you can look up on YouTube of them flying over Antarctica. So the truth is, no, you can fly over the South Pole, and it has been done. And in addition to that, there is, and again, you can, you can look this up and see it for yourself as well, there are, there's a yacht race that takes place around uh, Antarctica. It's a 14,000 kilometer yacht race in, I believe it was 2002, a guy named Fedor from Russia circumnavigated it solo in a, in a, uh, in a sailboat. And now they have a yacht race, and the, the last year a uh, woman was the first one to solo it, the first woman to, to do a solo trip around Antarctica. So you have hard evidence that, in fact, there is a South Pole, it is navigable, uh, there, there are planes that fly over it all the time, there's military aircraft that do all the time. And there have been airlines that have flown over Antarctica. There are no routes currently that go over Antarctica, although Qantas does fly very, very close uh, to Antarctica. They fly within 41 degrees of it. 
And you do see that if you look at the flight path from Santiago, Chile to Sydney, you'll see that it is like this. It's in an arc like this as it accommodates the, the sphere in the bottom half of the Earth. If you look at the UN map, and having flown a lot over the pole, if you look at the UN map, when I fly from here to Frankfurt, from Seattle to Frankfurt, it's about a 10 hour flight. If I take that same distance and I plug it in on the UN map, the flight from Santiago, Chile to Sydney would be 40 hours. From Sao Paulo, Brazil to Johannesburg would be 30 hours. But you can book a flight on Qantas right now that's 13 and a half hours from Santiago to Sydney. And you can book a flight on a, on a South African Airlines that goes from Sao Paulo, Brazil to Johannesburg in nine hours. So you have some empirical evidence that shows the Earth as being spherical. I'd like to thank you both for everything you're doing. Uh, my name is Michael. The question is, um, I'm being taught back in uh, the 60s and early 70s that the moon at one point was such a uh, close distance and is gradually getting farther away. How is there then, uh, since we're supposed to have signs, could there have been uh, blood moons back then when the distance was so close that there wouldn't have been any sun shining through their, uh, the Earth's atmosphere to create the blood effect on the moon? Who are you asking? Brother Steve, are you? Are you asking me again? Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, I mean, you know, and I think Sand has brought this up earlier, and I think it's a very good point that we have seen a significant amount of misrepresentation from uh, our own government. And I mean, for, for me, I know that NASA was the one that produced the hockey stick claiming that there was global warming. And of course the hard evidence was going to be New York underwater and the 20 feet of water in 2010 and all the ice on the earth gone by 2010 based upon the hockey stick was, that was developed by a scientist at NASA who is now in contempt of Congress because he refuses to turn over his data to Congress that he used to make the claim on the hockey stick. We know that the Smithsonian Institute has hidden all kinds of archaeology, like the evidence of giants, the evidence of Paleo-Hebrew in North America and so forth. They're hiding this stuff for destroying it because they have a narrative that they want to promote. And a lot of this narrative goes to what will be talked about tomorrow. We talk about vaccines, we talk about the agenda. That will be discussed. And so a lot of, and the scientific community, I mean, I'm with Zen in so many respects that the scientific community, they'll tell you point blank, we don't have knowledge. What we have is theory. If we have, we take the scientific method, we employ an experiment over and over again, and we can replicate it, we arrive at theory. We don't necessarily arrive at truth. We don't necessarily arrive at knowledge. But we do arrive at knowledge when it comes to scripture. Because there's a truth claim in scripture, ahya, asher, ahya. And that truth claim is not just a, therefore, a. It's I am, that I am. And uh, so that's significant. So in terms of the blood moons, look, there were blood moons, eclipses at the time that Mashiach was born. He was probably born on a blood moon eclipse. Thank you. Did you want to add, you want to respond to that? Just want to say thank you to both of you again. I have the deepest respect for both of you and uh, the views you're able to share today. Uh, my name is Chris Snead from Nashville, Tennessee. Had a question we need to Dr. Pigeon. Apologize then. No, it's fine. <laughs> Can you expound some more on this idea of um, uh, uh, how do you describe it? Out of its courses. Oh, out of its courses. Oh. Yes, and because yeah. you said scripture interprets scripture. So where else in the Bible does it clearly say that that phrase is is out of its courses? Yeah. And actually. There's actually a uh, there's actually a scripture that there's actually a scripture that uses the phrase out of its out of course. Um, so you just have to excuse me for one second because I don't have this I don't have the quote um, um, right in front of me, but I can try to dial it up for you. There is um, again you know when you talk about the Strong's Concordance, right? you're talking about something that talks about the usage of the term. It's not giving you a definition. It's giving you a, uh, the usage. Okay, hold on just a moment. Uh, yeah, yeah, here it is. 
this is going to be in um, Psalm 82.5, Psalm 82.5, and it reads, they know not, neither will they understand, they walk on in darkness, and all of the foundations of the earth are out of course, okay? And again, the foundations at the end, that passage is Mossad, like we talked before, the foundations, the Mossad. And uh, so, yeah, it is, you have, it, again, the passage is reading, they know not, neither will they understand, they walk on the darkness, all the foundations of the earth are out of course. Tamot. And again, this word tamot, or the phrase, the word is actually moat. The ta is a prefix. Um, but you have, where moat is concerned, let me give you some an example of some of how the way the word is used. A fallen and decay, slide, that it be moved, uh, that I am moved, that it be moved. I shall not be moved, I shall not slip, he shall not be moved. Uh, it slips, it's carried, he shall not be moved, for they shall cast to be moved, etc. So you see that moat actually means moved. And ball means lest, lest it be moved, right? And so, so it is a correct phrase to say it does not move. But it is equally correct to say it does not move out of its course. And so you see, you have this idea that the foundations of the earth are moved out of course. But yet on the other hand, David says, that it's not moved. So which is it? You know, he's talking about the fact that really the heavens are beyond us. And uh, we'll talk us more because I think Zen's point here tonight about geocentrism versus heliocentrism, yeah, I think it's still an issue. Uh, again, thank you all for this debate. It's been very enlightening. Uh, my name is Lanira, and my question is for Brother Zen. Um, earlier, Dr. Pugin said he described a um, celestial body or a solar system that may interact with our Earth atmosphere. And while I may have an idea of, maybe not necessarily Dr. Pugin, but others who hold that view, how they come to that conclusion, I'm wondering what do you think that incident is from a flat earth perspective. Does that make sense? How the, the celestial bodies interact with the atmosphere? Well, Dr. Pigeon described it as Planet X. Others oh, described okay, it as okay. Planet X. Yes. Okay, yeah, um, a lot of people, and you mentioned Gil Brazard, and I am of the opinion that uh, Planet X, Nibiru, whatever you want to call it, that it is some kind of an object. Now, I don't buy into that it is an Earth-like object because in my opinion, when you look up the terms for uh, all what are the planets, the wandering stars, they are luminaries and Earth is significant and separated from these celestial objects, which if you also look at the pagans, uh, how they named each of the days of the week, they named them after these celestial bodies. And the earth is not included into that because it's not considered the same thing. Um, and so with regard to Planet X, I do believe it, it has association to possibly the, what is called wormwood uh, within the scriptures and that there will be, even the, the stars are talked about as being cast down to the earth. I just recently did a show on how the stars crashing down to the earth, that that will be part of the judgment which is brought on those not written into the book of life. Because it talks about how there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and in my opinion, the stars being cast down to the earth it is what sets the earth ablaze and reforms it new uh, for the return of the coming of the bridegroom. So check that out. It's on my YouTube channel, both Endeavor Freedom or um, Zane Garcia's Stars Crashing to the Earth. 
Uh, and so, yes, uh, even in the Colburn Bible, it describes this particular object as the destroyer and speaks about it in the past as being used by the Most High God to bring on judgment to, uh, upon the wicked and the people of the earth in ancient times. It was also uh, connected to the destruction of Atlantis. And so, yes, it is some kind of a body, um, but it is not earth-like. It is not uh, terrestrial. It doesn't have form. It can't be landed on. I don't believe the Anunnaki live there or currently, you know, inhabit it. But, yeah, it, it is some kind of a celestial body, and it will have part to play in judgment. Hi, God bless both of you. Thank you for being here. My name is Lisa. I'm from Georgia. This is Chrisanne. You sort of corresponds with what you just said. Um, my question is, is if we have a protective dome. Uh, how is it the asteroids break through to the Earth's surface? Um, in my opinion, what we see as meteorites, asteroids, or whatever it is, um, that these objects are within the dome. Could be that they're pieces of the dome. I'm not sure. I, I know that my friend John Pounders on Now You See TV, he did a show with a guy named Meteorite Man, and he talks about uh, having studied the geology and looking into all of the different rocks that uh, possibly, even in some places in Africa, there's this uh, glass that's found in the desert that it could possibly be attributed to that. Um, but again, I do firmly believe that the scriptures are clear that the firmament is a solid structure and that it is dividing the waters above from the waters below and that being uh, either semi or totally transparent crystalline um, structure, that the reason we see the sky as blue is because we are seeing the waters above through this crystalline structure and, and that all of that is connected to that. But with regard, again, this is one of those things, planet X, asteroids, meteorites, all these kind of things, we really, now that we understand the world and the enclosed structure of it differently, we need more people to awaken to this paradigm and to study it. We need more scientists to investigate it and to take th these discuss discussions and introspection of them in serious manner so that we can come to better understanding on some of this phenomenon. Um, and so, Thank you for your question. Hello, thank you very much. This has been a great experience and uh, thank you for enlightening me and I'm sure our many people in here. So thank you very much for your own individual blessing, I guess, upon us. But um, the question that I was wondering was, since if there's a dome over the earth, then all the planets and stars are within the dome, then that means that there would be no external planets and there would be no aliens. So that means all the extra dimensional beings or life forms that supposedly exist would be within the dome. So my question is, what would be their purpose? What's, what's the end goal? What do these extra dimensional beings, if they're malicious, what's their end, what's their end goal? What's their intent? And then also, since there's a dome or a firmament, a firmament that separates the water from above from below, then does that mean that we're entirely encapsulated in water and that there's no space, that we're just simply submerged in water? So I guess my question is, are we surrounded by water and as well as these extra dimensional beings, what's their, what's their end goal if they want to manipulate us or if they want to, what do they want from us? What's what's the true war here, and I guess how can we fight against it? Or Great question. Uh, again, 
my opinion is that the fullness of the deception that began with the war in heaven, and I wrote my ninth book about this. Well, actually, no, it's my 11th book. Uh, the Great Contest, The War in Heaven, where I talk about how that war in heaven caused the Lucifer and one-third of the angels of the Most High to be cast down and to be banished here to the earth. In the book of the Secrets of Enoch, chapter 29 and 30, it talks about this event as occurring on the second day. And I also associate that the firmament being established also on the second day, that it was put into place in order to lock down and to imprison the fallen ones here to this particular dimensional time space. And the reason being is because judgment, that the sentence of death was pronounced upon them, as it says in Psalms 82, um, that they shall die the death of man. In Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, it speaks about Lucifer also, that he will die the death of man. And so after this 7,000 years of this second world age, in my opinion, they will be annihilated as if they had never been. But the whole reason for the deception, the counterfeit cosmology, the calendar system, all of this is to lead humanity astray, cause us all to believe in this coming extraterrestrial uh, alien God, this alien savior. And they are doing that in order to cause us to fall with them. They don't want, it says in the scriptures that they don't want any of the sons of man to inhabit or to regain our, their, our former estate and to regain the positions that they abandoned so very long ago. And so they don't want us to have part in salvation. They don't want Christ to come and to redeem us. And they want to lead as many astray as they can so that we fall with them and like them. Uh, because they're not only jealous of our salvation and the chances that have been you know, given to all of us, but they are hateful and angry at not only Christ, but at the uh, possibilities afforded to all of us and that we can, through him, be redeemed and that Christ is the way to salvation. And so they hate us and they want us to fall with them. I think Zen's making a very good point in that respect. The there was a recently a tunnel that was built in Switzerland. That was like the longest tunnel in the world or something. And they had this ceremony. And I watched this ceremony, this pagan ritual that was uh, really uh, a pagan pageantry at its extreme. But being somebody who can kind of see into the artwork, at the end of the festival is when it was the most alarming. And you had the bleachers set up there at the end of the tunnel. And all of the world leaders were sitting there in those bleachers. And then they had this image coming out and they had like a ramp like this. And they had a wall here. And they were showing like angels coming down and then you see the bride being prepared in white linen. And so all of these women were coming out in white linen and they were preparing for the rapture. And then out comes this Baphomet, right? The goat man. Out comes this Baphomet and he's running around doing his pagan stuff. And at the, the very end or the climax of this thing, it shows the Baphomet seducing the bride just before the rapture. Now, I can tell you that that is the protocol. When you're talking about changing the calendar, I mean, come on, we live on a calendar that has an arbitrary date fixed in the middle of the night when nobody's awake, right? You have these arbitrary hours that are established. You have, everybody knows that an octopus has eight arms. Then how is October the 10th month of the year? It's the eighth month of the year. November is the ninth month. Deca, December, is the 10th month. January is the 11th month, and February is the 12th month. Why do we know that? Because it's the last month we have to collect the extra day. That's what was on the Julian calendar. Even that was a, an approximation to what the Bible said or what Scripture said was the calendar. 
So you have people arbitrarily change, arbitrarily changing it. Who arbitrarily changed it? Gregory. Gregory arbitrarily changed it, and he did it in order to meet his expectation as to the birthday of the Messiah, which he thought was December 25th. And why did they appoint December 25th as the birthday? Because that's when they used to practice Saturnalia and the restoration of the sun coming back after three and a half days. And so the Saturnalia festival, they wanted to appoint Mashiach there. Well, guess what? In the scriptures, it's very clear that on the eighth day, Mashiach was circumcised when he was presented at the temple in strict accord with Torah. There's no question. All, all four Gospels reiterate the, the passage. Well, the eighth day from, September, from December 25th is January 1st. So the whole calendar of the entire world was changed by Gregory in order to mark the day of circumcision. Okay? Now, when we, when we begin to understand the kind of thinking that comes out of Rome, you're going to begin to see where a lot of this Antichrist impetus is coming from. What Zen is describing about the fallen watchers, you know, it's described in the Book of the, the, Book of the Giants, which is really a lamentation that was found in Qumran, because the giants are the, or even or even the epic of Gilgamesh, which is a secular book, describes the same thing. The giants know that their souls have no salvation whatsoever. And it is in the book of Enoch that they tell Enoch, Enoch, you go up there and you talk to Yah and you say, plead on our behalf. And when Enoch goes up there, Yah says, you are coming here on behalf of those I appointed to watch over you. That isn't going to happen. And so we as a species have been granted the mercy of Yah when you think about this. We have been granted the mercy of Yah with an approach towards salvation that has not been given to the fallen watchers. And arguably, Satan's fall occurred because of the creation of man. Because he was so jealous of the fact that man would come to judge the angels as it is written. And so this is what we have when you see this. When you, so when you talk about the impetus of all of this, and, and listen, the stuff about the ancient aliens, and all the stuff that you see the History Channel just pushing day after day after day after day. Forget it. You know, if you, you, know you have the true story about what the Watchers are doing, why they're here, and what they're up to. It's written in Scripture. You'll find it in the Ed Sefer. You'll find the true story about what they're doing and why they're doing it. And I can tell you that 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 uh, that's and they were they were not our progenitors they didn't come down here and create humanity Enoch is the one book that tells you humanity was here for seven generations before they came down here to manipulate the DNA Yes, and I think also the sumo, the sumo lessons. Um, I don't know if um, everybody has seen this or if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but uh, there's an individual that has shown that if you take a bubble um, in, in water and you put a certain frequency in it, it turns to light. And so in my opinion, the fact that we see the stars in the sacred geometric pattern that we do, especially now with people that are using these uh, P900 cameras to get a really close up of what stars really are, they are luminescence, they are lights, just as they are described in the scriptures, they're not sunlight or above and waters below. Hi guys, uh, my name is Daniel. Uh, thanks, both of you, for such a, this was an awesome debate, just watching it and everything. So, um, My question is kind of a spiritual, philosophical in nature, I guess you would say. 
I just recently read an article um, saying that they've been able to see past all of the galaxies uh, to, uh, you know, beyond our whole universe. And kind of like our universe is just a speck of light in a sea of empty blackness that goes on and exists forever and ever and ever. Um, in your own personal relationship with God, does that sound like that's what you would want to create? Just an empty black sea of nothingness forever and ever and ever. Don't you just love science? <laughs> I, I like when one of the guys from NASA came out and said, we found a meteor from Mars on Antarctica. Well, in compared to what other substance, do you know that that's a meteor from Mars? You know, we, I like the more recent NASA study. We found a solar system with seven livable planets on it. You remember this? All livable, blah, 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 blah. You know, come off it. I mean, these guys are just so far gone from reality. Now, there's a real question, though, when you talk about the universe is compared to, like, for instance, when we look out in the macro and then we look into the micro. And uh, there's a guy who I kind of follow and who has proposed the uh, unified field theory in physics uh, based upon Planck's constant. But Planck's constant is dependent upon the concept that there is curvature. There is curvature. And when you say there is curvature, that means that it's finite. It's not infinite. And I really see, when we talk about this idea of the waters above and the waters below and the firmament being solid, that we do have a universe that is the firmament. I mean, it says in scripture, the firmament is heaven. And so when we look at what the firmament is, you know, I take the position, I'm not a Big Bang theorist in any respect. Okay? Even Stephen Hawking disavowed his own Big Bang theory. He said it doesn't work. But there is this thing called the string theory, but the string theory talks about and discusses in this concept of light cutting through the darkness. John 1 talks about the light shines through the darkness, but the darkness does not understand it. The darkness doesn't attach to it. And, that, and Zen mentioned it here, that you talk about the sacred geometry of creation, that there is a sacred geometry in creation. In fact, there really is no matter. What you have is you have light cutting through the darkness, and that light is a extremely complex, multi-dimensional equation that we perceive as matter. We understand it as matter. But in reality, it's that's not what it is at all. It is the light of Mashiach, who is the light of the world, who is the light of existence. It is that light which has been captured in sacred geometry, geometry that creates all that we see. And that that solidity that we see in the in the universe, all of that matter that is in existence that we can perceive, is in fact the firmament. Now the waters above and the waters below are an interesting question because you have Kepha, Peter, saying that Yah is a consuming fire. Well, is he fire or is he water? It's a question. And I think we do not understand that as, as I explained Earlier, not here, but in a different place. When you read the, the, the scripture, it says, Amer Elohim. And therefore, Elohim said is how it would be quoted in, in English. Now, we think said, you're thinking that, okay, be light. And he said it around 750 hertz, and it was heard by the ear, and you know, and so, you know what I mean? But that isn't what happened with the voice of Elohim at all. Because the, the, what is the frequency response of the voice of Elohim? Zero to 100 nanohertz. I mean, what's the frequency response? But in his voice, all of creation comes out. All of color, all of light, all of existence comes out of this voice, which is expressed across a huge boundary of frequency. And so, you know, in terms of what I believe personally, I believe that the universe, the existence, the firmament is finite. It's discrete. There's an end to it. And that outside of this firmament, that there are waters above and waters below that are infinite. They're in, infinite in both respects. And that the new heavens and the new earth are, are going to reflect this, but that there is, as it says in John, all things were made through him, by him, for him. Nothing was made that was outside of Mashiach. And so this is the firmament. The firmament is 
him. He created it. It is his light. Uh, in my opinion, as far as the creation, it's very specific that uh, it was created for us and that we and all the creatures made were specially created to inhabit the different elements and different mediums that create the enclosed world system. All of that NASA puts forth with the ever-expanding universe and that all the stars are sons and of themselves and that they all have planetary systems and that you know as long as the planets are in the Goldilocks zone that they can evolve life all of that is to take away from the intelligent design and that God is responsible for all that we see and it is again to separate us from knowledge and intimate relationship with him and it's also to detract from the scriptures being the inerrant word of God because when you know that the gospel was written and delivered to the apostles and the prophets by the designer the grand architect and you know that it's trustworthy and truthful then if you want to understand the cosmology all you have to do is go to it, seek it, and study it out. Uh, hi guys, my name is Tyler. Uh, first of all, it's a huge blessing to be here, uh, being as young as I am, and you guys uh, sharing the truth with all of us while I face the lies in high school classrooms. Uh, it's really a, it's really a blessing to just hear. Welcome that. to our world. <laughs> um, from my understanding um, and my belief um, in Gen on the first book of Genesis, uh, it says that uh, God created the firmament, which separated the water from the waters. Uh, my understanding is that there's the waters um, here on Earth, and there's the waters of the heaven, and that the waters on the Earth were also separated from the firmament as well as the waters of the heaven being separated from the firmament. Now, my question is for you, uh, Dr. Pigeon, if, um, there, if, the water, uh, if there's waters of the heavens, and if I'm being scientifically correct about this, um, and the waters that are on earth, um, sunlight shines only so deep you can, in, until it gets to complete darkness um, from the water here on earth. Now, how in a heliocentric, uh, spherical, um, ball. yeah, ball of, of what we would call Earth, um, how does light get through the firmament and the waters of the heavens to give us day? That's my question. From 93 million miles away. Well. As I said before, I think the firmament is the heaven, right? I think the firmament is the heaven. And in fact, the passage in Job that talks about, uh, that talks, uh, it discusses it being poured out of some molten glass, discusses that what is being poured out of some molten glass is actually a thin vapor. Now, you have to remember that my assumption is not that there is a dome over the earth. My assumption is, is that it, it is a sphere and that it is surrounded by an atmosphere probably a seven layer atmosphere and that that atmosphere is discrete from uh, what exists outside of that atmosphere in other words we can kind of understand that there is like a firm shell around the earth but it's not firm like something you can knock on it's firm in terms of its atmosphere and it is discrete and protective from uh, a space that includes something different now, when you're talking about light shining through that atmosphere, it's not difficult whatsoever because it's a thin vapor rather than a thick vapor. And so it's very possible for light to travel 93 million miles. So you've got to remember that when we talk about uh, the light of the sun, and we're talking about, and again, 93 million miles is the current estimate. When you, when you talk about the light of the sun, you're talking about a certain amount of lumens. We talk about the CME's coronal mass ejections, for instance, that are putting out UV rays. You know that when you step outside, you can get sunburned. 
There's some days you get you get sunburned. There's sometimes during the day you get sunburned. All those are empty ones that have been recorded. During the day, right? A lot of that has to do with UV radiation. But the UV radiation okay. and the travel, why traveling through that atmosphere is not that difficult a proposition. It becomes a difficult proposition if you have a model that says there is something firm over the Earth and the sun is outside that firmament. And what I say to you is that the sun, the stars, and all of what we see in, in that area is the firmament. You see, I distinguish that firmament from that which we cannot see. What we see and everything that we see is the firmament. And so I don't think it's difficult at all for light to travel through uh, the atmosphere of Earth. In fact, I think it's very predictive. And not only is it predictive, but I think we are protected from a lot of the harmful UV radiation by an electromagnetosphere that, that uh, encircles the Earth that is dependent upon a North Pole and a South Pole. You know, when you have a magnet, it's got a North Pole and it's got a South Pole. The FE theory doesn't really accommodate the South Pole theory. But a magnet has a North Pole and a South Pole, and it would accommodate an electromagnetic sphere around a planet that has an atmosphere into which light can penetrate. But not all of the light. There is a certain amount of light that is deflected and not allowed in so that we don't fry. And so that is, I do believe that that is totally consistent with what is, with what's being told in Scripture as well. But I want to say this about what you're going through in high school. You know, high school is, uh, there are some sad things in high school because you are told to accept false premises and if you don't accept them, you will not proceed. And of course, colleges have become even more hostile. You not only have to accept false premises, but you have to adopt transhumanism ideals to be admitted into college, right? And they will expel you and defame you should you take a position contrary to that. It's a very difficult place to be. And I know the young people have to have a lot to juggle. So I wanted to congratulate you if you're navigating that. We are going way well, uh, beyond well. our time limit. So if we keep answers to two yes, minutes, okay. We will be done in eight minutes, and that way we can finish and go for dinner, yes? Okay, so now you're on the time Thank restriction. You. All right, let's just finish them up, but you have time restriction, two minutes. Okay. Thank you all for doing us what you do in construction and training. My name is Roger, and uh, I've been at that kind of the tail end of everything that's coming on. A lot of the things that I was going to ask are being answered as we go through this. My question is, is uh, observe that there's a dome, but also I have a question about the Van Allen belt and its protection of the, the Earth itself in, in the dome model, or in the, the sphere of the model. Are we trying to destroy that covering that we have that would keep us from a lot of the things that are happening external, say the meteors, the satellite, or the, the things, the falling objects, is it a protection from extra dimensional uh, zones that would then gain access to the Earth if we're destroying it maybe with CERN? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, you brought up CERN and the Van Iron Belt. I mean, that's, I mean, that's great stuff. But I'll just say this to you. Yeah, we're committing suicide right now. And Let's, let's just face the truth of it, okay? There's a passage in the book of Daniel in chapter 4 where Nebuchadnezzar says that Yah raises up the basest of men to rule over us. Now, I'm just going to say it point blank. We have some of the most extreme Satan-worshipping perverts you can imagine who are in the leadership of this world right now. And they are doing everything they can to destroy this world. If they can't do it through CERN, then they'll do it through chemtrails. If they can't do it through chemtrails, they'll come up with some other lie. But they are doing everything they can to destroy humanity and to destroy our ability to live here. And we sit here in this room and allow them to do it.
Frank, I was uh, in the United States Air Force. This is a real uh, question. Um, when it comes to air travel, the number one cost is fuel. So if the Earth is spinning at a little over a thousand miles an hour eastward, wouldn't all airlines want to travel west to keep those distance shorter and fuel consumption down? Because if you travel east, you'd be going against time. And I've traveled east plenty of times being in the Air Force, and we only traveled about 600 miles an hour. So no, we would go nowhere. So can you explain that on a, on a globe earth? No problem. You know, one time I was flying nonstop from Moscow back to Seattle, and we left Moscow at noon Friday, and we got into Seattle at noon on Friday. And so I told the pilot, hey, listen, can we keep going and fly to Moscow so I can get there before I leave? <laughs> you know, the, 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 it's a discrete system. And so this is what you see. A lot of the stuff that's talked about airlines flying and so forth, it's a discrete system. So you're flying, when you calculate you're flying 600 miles an hour, you're flying 600 miles an hour in respect of that discrete system. In other words, the whole system is moving, and you're just moving 600 miles an hour in relationship to the whole system moving, whether you're going that way or you're going this way. It makes no difference which way you're going. It's a discrete system. It's wholly enclosed. So when you say the Earth is spinning 1,000 miles an hour, it's spinning 1,000 miles an hour against what? What are you measuring the, it against at that you're saying it's spinning 1,000 miles an hour against? Sure. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I, well I, I, I'm just saying, you're not, there's nothing that it's spinning against. In other words, let's see, I don't know how to put this, other than to say there's no force that's coming against it. Okay? All the force that will come against the plane is contained within the discrete system. It doesn't have to fly. In other words, if you were to put it outside the discrete system, then you could talk and say, how fast is it flying? And in fact, a lot of people will tell you that when you get into an outer orbit, that that's in fact what they do, as compared to what you're doing inside the discrete system that is the atmosphere. And so it, it's absolutely no problem whatsoever for a plane to fly 600 miles an hour in that direction or 600 miles an hour in this direction. It's within the discrete system. Dividing the waters from the waters, if the firmament is heaven, what waters is it dividing it from? How would another planet be habitable if that planet has no heaven to separate the waters? Thanks, Genevieve. <laughs> I'm not the one that said that the firmament's heaven. That's what it says in Genesis 1.8. It says that the firmament he called heaven. And what I'm saying to you, what is the water above and what is the water below? Mm, well, that's a good question. You know, do we understand, you know, when you when you when you look at who is the eternal father, right? We know and who do you believe is the father? What is the Father's name, and what is the Son's name, if you can tell, said Solomon in the Proverbs. And so the question is, that's really kind of banks on it. When you look at what is outside of existence and eternity, what is that? And the scriptures here define it, define it as the waters above and the waters below, into which was created the tohu bohu, Genesis 1-2. The void and without form. The creation was void and without form. In Genesis 1-2 it says. And then he created the firmament which he called heaven. Which divided the waters above from the waters below. But it, before the heavens were there it was tohu bohu. It was void and without form. All of existence that I understand as existence is the firmament.
Hello, gentlemen. My name is Joshua. I have a question for the both of you. Um, what I'm thinking about right now is the stars. They're in the firmament, correct? Yeah, correct. So conceivably, even in the, in the flat Earth model, you would be able to travel to them. Um, now, it, it makes a difference because I've heard someone uh, some say that you know there's a dome that you hit, you can't go any further. But the dome would be above the stars, right? Now, in light of that, have we been to the moon? What do you think? <laughs> show to us that the earth is spherical should should let us all know that it's not because if it was why would you have to hoax it and if they're hoaxing that you know they their credibility is shot and you can't trust anything that they say uh, as far as the stars they're not as large a size as what they are trying to attribute them to be and they are not earth-like and so you can't land on them in my opinion Well, as Tower of Power would say, ah, when we went to the moon, what in heaven happened here on Earth? That was the question. Uh, do I believe that we did a moon landing? You know, I really don't. I'm not a big a fan of the moon landing concept. I think when I looked at it, I had a problem with a couple of things. One was the lunar landing module. I mean, you know, you know, when you look at how much rate of speed it's required to get velocity to come off the Earth, my son and I sat and studied the physics of this. Saturn V, possible, just barely possible to get enough speed to, to leave the atmosphere given the Earth's rotation. When you're talking about leaving the moon with four little rockets on the retro thing, hey, I've got a question about that, you know. Uh, but now, and then the next question is, is, did the Apollo missions go there? Did they do this? Did they do that? Did the other thing? I mean, we just have some issues about that. Does that mean that that changes my perspective that the moon is 240,000 miles from the Earth? No. Does it change my perspective that it's a sphere? No. Does it change my perspective that it's orbiting the Earth? No, it doesn't. And remember, because even a watch, when it's broken, tells the correct time twice a day. My name is Alan, and I just want to thank all y'all also. Thank you for enjoying this all the way here in this room. And uh, this question is for you, Dr. Fidget. All right, I'm ready. It's working? Okay, so when I read the scripture. And wait, wait, see if you can get that okay. working when you get this question. Move your hand, move your hand a little lower on the, on the microphone. Move it There you go. Okay. Put it in orbit. In orbit? <laughs> <laughs> all, right. all right, so. When I read the scriptures like a child, like Yeshua says we should, you know, we see in Psalm 119, the heavens declare the glory of God, God, and the firmament shows his handiwork, the notes of handiwork. It's called the firmament of his power. There's power to it. The, in Psalm 119 also says it's like a tent. We get that as he spoke about. And the sun is like a bride running a race on a circuit. And then, so I'm going to take when you're here and see if you can help us. So we have this idea of, as you said, it's hard as a molten looking glass. It's like a tent. It's uh, And then what I'm taking to here is see if you can help me with this scripture here in Ezekiel uh, 1.22. So it's the vision of divine glory. You know, you have... <laughs> well, you have uh, now over the heads of the living beings something like a firmament, like an awesome gleam of crystal. So it's over there. It's not everything. It's something solid over their heads, and it continues on and on. In Ezekiel 1:25, and there came a voice from above that it from them that was over their heads. Whenever they stood still, they dropped their wings. Now above the expanse or the firmament that was over their heads, there was something resembling a throne, like lapis lazuli, which is like a blue appearance, like sapphire, and that's his throne. So 
you have all these things combined, and there's more in scripture, to show that there's this substance that is hard, that is solid. You combine it to the sea of glass, where his throne is attached to. Where is that in your firmament explanation? And see if you can help us with those scriptures. Okay, we are really very seriously about the time. I hope you guys are okay with that. I just want to ask, okay. Zen, are you okay? Yeah. Steve? I'm okay until we got to that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to hand you microphone and keep it short and to the point. Yeah, I will try that. It's difficult for me to talk about Ezekiel 125 because, of course, I have to look uh, much more closely at the scripture, at the Hebrew scripture, to see what it's talking about, because um, you know, again, there's so much in so much in the scripture that becomes uh, uh, very difficult when you're looking when you look at the English as compared to the Hebrew. Okay, and I mean, I give an example. Even in the Masoretic text, when you look at the Masoretic text, you get stuff that is different from what the Strong's Concordance is telling you is there. A lot of times the words are just wrong. This, there'll be a strong approximation, and they'll say this is the word in Strong's, and it isn't, and it's some different word. And you'll also get prefixes. And you'll hear Stephen Benin talk about this quite often on his Reading News Live when you get discussion about is that a feminine plural? Is that a masculine plural? What those differences make, and what the prefixes are, and what the suffixes are, will tell you a, a world of difference. Like, for instance, when you talk about uh, it being over, their head, over, over the head, right? And so the word there in, in uh, Ezekiel 125 is actually Roshim. Roshim. So it's head, it's not head, right? I mean, just to give you an example, now, do I know what the Hebrew word is there that's being used for over? I don't. I haven't had a chance to look at this. But when you talk about where is the heavenly throne, you know, you have... You have a discussion in the Ascension of Isaiah talking about the seven heavens. Isaiah himself said he saw the throne. You know, John, uh, John the Revelator, Yahukaman, he says he thought, saw the throne. Hanok was taken to the throne, right? And so you have this idea of the throne and who is sitting on the throne. And where is that throne? And that's a question. And I think it, it goes to the same kind of a question as to where is the heavenly Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. Now, for me, I think that's in another dimension, a dimension that we can't see. Just as we have auditory sound that we can't hear, there are things that we cannot see in creation. Uh, to give you an example, we all talk on our cell phone, right? Now, if, if we were all talking in here right now, we'd all be talking in range between about 700 and 800 hertz. That would be the range. But when you talk on a cell phone, you're talking between 800 megahertz and 2.5 megahertz, okay, uh, 2.5 thousand megahertz. That's the range you're talking in. Now, if I had ears that could hear that, I'd be hearing every cell phone conversation in downtown Seattle when I'm driving through there. I'd hear it all, right, because it's all being broadcast and amplified. and be blowing my head off the, the kind of chatter that was going on. Well, it's the same thing when you talk about the, the dimensions that exist in the heavens. See, I think that there is a little bit more than just the physical reality that we see, that there is a that there are seven heavens. And when, you know, in, in, in the scripture, when you look at the book of Hebrews, what does it say? It said, Enoch was translated. It says, Enoch was translated. What does that mean, translated? He was brought out of this dimension. He was brought into a heavenly dimension. In, in the ascension of Isaiah, they talk about uh, Mashiach coming down through seven dimensions. And as he comes down through the seven heavens, each of the heavenly bodies in those heavens say to him, what are you doing here? I mean, when he ascended, they said, what are you doing here? How is it we didn't see you descend? And he says, because I took your shape when I descended through. And Paul says, what does it mean that he ascended, but that he descended first? So you're talking about a mystery here that exists. And so we talk about, we talk about where is the throne? Where is the white throne? And, and and I don't disagree with Zen at all that that Yah is looking down on us, but I do disagree that the Earth is the very center. And here's the reason why: when you look at the choosing of the house of Yasharel in the Book of Jubilees, it talks about it in chapter two. 
And it says, I did not choose you because you were the fastest, the wealthiest, the smartest, the best looking, the tallest, the most likely to succeed. No, 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 no. I chose you because you would keep my Shabbat. You would guard and keep my Shabbat. I mean, this is what it says. As I have sanctified the Sabbath in heaven, so you are commissioned to guard and keep it here on earth. And you, the house of Yashorel, are chosen to guard my Shabbat. Now, there were other people on earth at that time. There, it wasn't that the house of Yashorel was suddenly in the most populated place, in the most plentiful place, in the, in the richest place. No, not at all. In fact, they were in captivity. But Yah chose Yasharel, and he said, the seed of Yasharel is my firstborn. And so it is, you know, it, it, there is a genuine choosing and selection that has taken place in the house of Yasharel. And this selection has to do with Yah's mystery, not our mystery. It would be nice if we could conceive it and say, we are the very center. My name is David. Thank you both for being here. I have a question in regard to North and South Pole temperature and ice amounts. Why is there a difference when they both, one that's, you know, the North Pole is going to get uh, during the winter, and actually during the summer months of the Northern Hemisphere is going to get the same amount of sun as the summer in the Southern Hemisphere six months later. So why is there a huge ice differential between the two regions and also temperature differentials. And also one other question, why is, if the earth is spinning eastward, why is the jet stream also spinning eastward approximately 100 miles an hour faster? Why are you asking this? Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. I'll, I'll restrict it to two minutes. The, the Arctic Ocean, of course, is at the North Pole. And so you have water currents that are coming up from around the world, the Atlantic and the Pacific, all pour into the Arctic Ocean. And so water will increase the temperature dramatically. Whereas the Antarctica is, appears to be a hard, hard continent. And so as a consequence, the ice sits longer. And in addition to that, not only is the Arctic, the Antarctic uh, not uh, populated with water, but it's also a desert region. Believe it or not, it doesn't rain there. It has virtually no precipitation whatsoever. So you have really nothing there that it is going to cause it to warm whatsoever. But in the Arctic, you do have warming. You have warming waters that pass through. And uh, your second question has to do with the jet stream. And again, what you see inside the Earth is a discrete system inside an atmosphere. And, that, and the discrete system allows for it to move against itself as it sees fit. Just because it is rotating outside the discrete system will not affect what's going to happen with the discrete system inside the place. Like I pointed out before, if I took a, if I took a, 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 a glass ball that had a Seattle in it and I spun it around in the water, it, it wouldn't affect what's going on in the glass ball. If I had one of those and shake it up and the snow comes down, I could spin it around the water, the snow would still come down. Uh, in my opinion, the reason we see this temperature variation between the Arctic and the Antarctic is because as the sun moves back and forth between the two tropics, when it moves closer to the Tropic of Cancer, its orbital, uh, its motion, its circular revolution is slower and tighter. And so the Arctic region gets a lot more sunshine over that period when the summer months are occurring over the Arctic. And the revolution of the sun when it is near the Tropic of Capricorn is wider and very much faster. And so the sun is moving at, uh, twice as much as far as the speed. And so um, that's also why sunset occurs very quickly 
in the southern latitudes. And so it's not receiving sunlight in the same way. And this variation shows us um, that, you know, we're not living on a globe because if it were, it, it would be similar. And even with when you look at all the, the creatures, the type of vegetation, all of that, it's very much different. There's like a mountain of ice in the Antarctic regions, and it's not the same in the Arctic. I cover this in very great detail um, in my flat earth that's key to decrypt the Book of Enoch. It also shows that, you know, there's not even a lot of animals. I think there's like maybe one fly during the uh, summer months in Antarctica, and there's no human uh, people that live there, whereas the Arctic, there have been people living there for thousands of years, and so very huge differentiation. Hi guys, my question is for Dr. Pigman. Um, I think you guys. And while a lot of these concepts seem either too mathematically or theoretically complex for my little brain, um, you've definitely demonstrated knowledge not only with scripture but also um, just in the inner workings of all of your findings. And um, I always kind of want to, even in the few years that I've been looking into Flat Earth, come back to basics, bring it back to Earth, so to speak, and kind of 101 is the issue of the curve. So I'm interested in how you explain um, the issue of curvature based on the circumference proposed by NASA and what Zen brought up with um, the Chicago skyline and Lady Liberty um, and why those distances or why those images or structures are even visible when they shouldn't be based on that circumference in the curve. You guys keep asking me the tough questions. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, there's a couple of ways of figuring out the curvature. Okay. From my point of view, the most reliable way is to use the Pythagorean theorem based upon the radius of the Earth and not a hypercalculus based upon the, uh, covering the tangent of the Earth. Although ultimately you would reach the same conclusion. The difficulty is this, that when you look at, when you're, when you're talking about looking at the curvature of the earth, you can't just measure and say, well, look, I can see, uh, I can see a hundred miles. Okay. You can see a hundred miles, but what is your elevation off the ground? That's question number one, because your elevation is going to make a difference as to how, how far you can see using the Pythagorean theorem. You should be able to see about 160 miles of something, whatever it is that you're going to look. Now, the problem is when you see these pictures of the Chicago skyline or Lady Liberty or some of these other stuff, you'll see when you look closely at those photos that are being used to prove this, that there's portions missing, like half of Chicago is missing. For instance, you see the upper portion of the skyline. But if the earth was flat, there would be absolutely no loss whatsoever at the bottom of the picture from 150 miles or even 200 miles. There should be zero loss, none whatsoever. I should be able to see the very first floor of the tallest building in Chicago from 100 miles away. And the photos that I've seen, all you can see is the top of the skyline. Yeah, you may be able to see the crown on the Statue of Liberty, but I'm not seeing the Ellis Island uh, shop that's at the base of the Statue of Liberty. Now, there's a, there's a reason for that. And again, I don't accept the calculation that's being given by the flat earth people saying that it's, it's supposed to have a certain amount of loss over a certain period of time because it does not reflect using the Pythagorean theorem to calculate the curve. Now, in addition to that, in addition to that, there is a certain amount of reflection. For instance, when the sun sets, you'll see a red sky at night for about another eight to 10 minutes after the sun has left the horizon. There's a reason for that, and that's because the light is reflecting off the atmosphere. You have to calculate that. So that, for instance, the example given in Hawaii where the mountain is supposedly 180 miles away does ignores the fact that the person who's taking that picture was at least 200 feet from sea level. That's going to make a difference in terms of calculating the tangent. So there's a whole bunch of things to reconsider when you're talking about how far you can see around the curvature. Um, I, you quoted a scripture earlier, and forgive me if this is not the, the exact one that you were referencing, but you said that there was a scripture speaking about the course of the earth, 
And the only one I was able to find was in Psalm 82. And again, forgive me for putting another one. But I took the liberty to read um, right above the verse that, that I was able to find. And it says, how long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? So uh, defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. So by reading up a couple of verses, is it not much more likely that the interpretation of the earth being out of course is our spiritual choices and walk rather the physical earth being out of course when you, when you look at the context of the psalm? And further, if one were to completely ignore the rest of Psalm 82 and the context that this verse is written in, is there anything in research that has been found that if the earth actually was moving and had a course, that the course is an orbit, is it not much more plausible or even at all a possibility that it's linear or even zigzag if we're moving? Is there anything scriptural that says we are on a course and that course is an orbit rather than us moving straight in the line and everything else going around us? First of all, I want to congratulate you on that question because I think the question was very well stated that you really can't take any aspect of scripture out of context. It's very important to look at the context of a, of a given scripture to see what's being said. And so the, the first, I want to congratulate you on that insight. And when you look at that particular passage in scripture, it's still the point I was making when I was talking about that particular passage is that you have this use of the word moat, again, in talking about what this word moat means. Now, is there any other scripture that says that it's in orbit? And the answer is, yeah, it's that scripture in Isaiah that says the circle, he sits upon the circle of the earth. So when you say it's, he sits upon the circle of the earth, and when you look at that word circle, who, again, that hood appears three times in scripture, right? Once is as a circle, once is as a circuit, and once is as a compass. And when you talk about that compass, you're not talking about the kind of compass that you use when you're drafting something. You're talking about something that encompasses, that comp encompasses as in moving around. When you talk about a circle, he sits upon, if I were to say, I'm gonna take circle out, and I'm gonna put in another word that's used for hood, circuit, he sits upon the circuit of the earth. Well, if I, if the instant I say he sits upon the circuit of the earth, you know that something's in motion. But the 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 uh, English interpreters from you're talking about from John Calvin forward have used the word circle. He sits upon the circle of the earth. So yeah, there is a scripture that says it is in motion. <laughs> Uh, my question about the prison. One person in Chile and one in Mecklenburg. Both West, one person in Chile and one person in Mecklenburg. They're both flushed to the toilet at the same time. One goes clockwise and the other goes counterclockwise. Why is that so? You know, that question, my, my son-in-law is currently working off the coast of Australia, and uh, and he kind of talks about some of the anomalies they see. One of the anomalies they see down there is that up here, we see the sliver moon uh, and going to the quarter moon and the full moon, it goes kind of laterally this way, right, horizontally. But down in the southern hemisphere, it goes vertically. And you have, you have other things, too. For instance, in the southern hemisphere, they don't see Polaris. They see something else. They see a different set of stars than we see in the northern hemisphere. And if it was a flat Earth, wouldn't we all see the same stars? Wouldn't Polaris be in the middle for everybody? But it's not. In the southern hemisphere, they get a different view. Now, as for the toilets flushing in the alternate direction, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know that that's true, okay? 
uh, but uh, I mean, it's certainly it's been discussed a lot. But there are anomalies between the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere. Okay, is that a question? Okay, so. Okay. She wants to ask later. Yeah, you had one member of the South River by Coach Byron. Well, I can't see that. You guys basically have already answered, uh, answered this directly, but I just wanted to ask you because it was handed to me as a written question. One of the layers above the Earth is the thermosphere, which is between 500 uh, to 200, uh, 2,000 degrees Celsius. No metal on the Earth can withstand uh, the, the temperatures without melting. The question is, how did we, or how we went to the, another question is, how, how did we uh, go to the moon passing through the thermosphere? Which, by the way, Russia answered that question too. Who wants to answer? In my opinion, the temperatures of the thermosphere totally show us that satellites can exist up there and that the component parts that they are said to be made of, um, there's no way that, that they can exist being made of gold, which is malleable and will melt at less than 2,000 degrees Celsius, uh, that the circuitry and the, you know, the, um, the boards that are said to uh, the solar powered boards, all of that, it couldn't exist up there. And so satellites are another myth and the temperatures of the thermosphere, if you study and look into that, uh, confirm that as well. This is for Zen. Uh, my name is Mark Sargent. And the question is, well, if the, uh, let me rephrase this. I think the Tower of Babel only works on a flat earth. What do you think? Uh, I, I agree. Uh, same thing with, you know, the mountain exceedingly high. And also it, it states that in the scriptures that uh, they were trying to break into the firmament to get into uh, where the Most High sits and that they were going to wage war with God there. I have a quote in my firmament book about that. It's from the Chronicles of Jeremiah. So I think it's the same thing, you know, the uh, trying to create the tower to get into somewhere, that uh, same thing with the exceedingly high mountain. And we appreciate you coming here, Mark, and joining us for fellowship. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I just wanted to say this is this has been a great event, and I really appreciate being invited here uh, by Israeli News Live to be able to participate. It's great to, to, to meet Zen face to face so that we can have this conversation. And I really want to give my thanks to all of this uh, group that has been, uh, of course, a fellowship of believers who have carried themselves with uh, great respect and integrity. And so thank you and bless you. Yeah, thank all of you for making the journey here to join us in fellowship. It's been a wonderful time meeting you and engaging you in conversation. Uh, we look forward to further discourse, and uh, let's all just keep learning together because there's a lot to come to discernment on with regard to these topics. God bless all of you. In your Here's what's in. Both candidates, we love them both equally, by the way. Uh, so we will continue love one another. And tomorrow we are back here at 10 o'clock.